We are now live on Facebook and we're going to get started by, which I should have done before we went live, but um, Sarah, do you want to do the spotlighting? If you can. I can try, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I should have done that before we went live. Um, I... Not seem to spotlight myself is the problem. I also cannot find where to spotlight. Spotlight for everyone. There's Josh. Get my face off the screen. Uh, Hi, folks. We're just getting set up here and all spotlighted. I believe I am spotlighted at this time. I'm going to, and here is our interpreter. Um, I think we want both on the screen at the same time. So Dana, can you turn your video on? If you don't mind. Thank you. I can't spotlight you unless your video is on apparently. Um, so now yeah. we're all very professional. Not interpret, I can't spotlight myself, so I'm going to do this without spotlighting myself. Um, I, I can spotlight you, uh, Debbie, one second. Oh, can you? Thank I you. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't spotlight myself for some reason. Um, okay, sorry, I'm going to start it. Um, I'm going to start tonight by reading an apology. Last night in our town hall event, a question was asked, which ended up causing harm to members of our community. We appreciate the people who spoke up and we sincerely apologize for this oversight on our part. The question will not be asked tonight and we have removed it from the airing that is on our Facebook page right now. Um, and we will work internally as an organization to ensure we do better in the future. Thank you. And thank you all so much for sharing your evening with us again. My name is Debbie Wiseman, and I'm the Vice Chair of Happy City St. John's. Uh, I'm going to spend a, a minute or two telling you about Happy City. We are a nonprofit, volunteer-led organization. We've been around for over 10 years now, and our mandate is to inform, encourage, and facilitate dialogue around issues in the city of St. John's. We do that by holding events like our biannual Neighborhood Summit, which will be held again in April 2022. Uh, live and in person. We live tweet uh, council meetings. We hold different forums for citizens to get together and talk and learn from each other. And we do events like this one tonight. All the questions you will hear tonight were submitted by citizens. The city of St. John's is in the middle of an election. And with our limited resources this year, we decided to focus on the at-large position. We have 13 people running for the position of at-large counselor this year. So we put out a call and 11 of the candidates responded. This is night two. And tonight we are going to hear from Jess Puttister, Maggie Burton, Ron Ellsworth, Mark House, and Sandy Hickman. I should say uh, Maggie and Sandy are incumbents. Our moderator, Josh Snee, will ask a series of five questions. Each candidate will then have two minutes to answer. We supplied the questions in advance a couple of days ago, so the candidates would have time to do any research needed to answer the questions effectively. The order in which we call on the candidates has been randomized. Um, Josh will be keeping time and he's going to post a reminder to the candidates when they get close to the two minute mark. Um, you may have noticed we have ASL interpreters. We thank them for being here tonight. Uh, they will be on screen at all times and they they switch back and forth. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Josh. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, everyone. So I'm Josh Smee. Um, Right now in my day job, I'm the CEO of a, of a food security organization called Food First NL. Um, but once upon a time, I was the chair of the board at Happy City. Uh, and I'm still uh, follow what Happy City is doing with lots of interest. And occasionally they uh, dust me off and drag me out for things like this. So I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here tonight. Um, 
like Debbie said, my, my primary role tonight is actually as timekeeper. Um, the goal of, of tonight is to, is to move fairly briskly through these questions. So it is two minutes each. I will be uh, drawing a hard line on that. Uh, the other thing to say is that this is meant to be very much a, a respectful and collaborative community forum. Uh, it is not meant to be uh, a debate in the sense we will, it, there is not a space for crosstalk here. Um, we would ask candidates to wait their turn uh, and then to take their two minutes to explain their position uh, on the question or the issue. Um, so hopefully that will be the most valuable thing for the folks who are listening in. I know I found the uh, last night's session very valuable uh, in my own decision making, I'm sure tonight as well. Uh, so that's how tonight is going to work. We'll have a series of questions. We've randomized the order of which candidate will be uh, will be answering first. Uh, every candidate will have two minutes. Uh, and if you miss anything, don't worry, the recording will be up on the Happy City Facebook site uh, following this event. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, and uh, our first question actually um, fun for me. This one comes from the folks at the St. John's Food Policy Council and from NL Eats. Um, so from this recent St. John's Food Assessment, people of all incomes and ages across the city recognize that increased income is the most needed change to improve food access. Where a living wage in St. John's is calculated as $18.85 an hour, would you support the city of St. John's in adopting a living wage policy to ensure firms contracted directly or subcontracted by the city uh, pay their employees a living wage? So that question goes first to Jess Puddister. Uh, Jess, over to you. I'm going to start your timer now. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, I want to start by saying that I've been a long-term supporter of provincially legislated living wage in the province. Um, but in the context of the city, I'd really like to see a list of contracted and subcontracted services um, that we currently pay for at the municipal level. So I can know um, the degree to which this is actually a serious issue that we're facing. Um, the skilled trades and consulting services that we contract out are known to pay their employees a living wage. Um, so I'd actually much sooner take concrete steps toward a social procur procurement policy to incentivize social enterprises applying for city tenders, um, ensuring that we are maximizing social impact for every public dollar invested in city services. This would really give a leg up to community groups in supporting marginalized people through programming and valuable work experience. Um, I'd also love to collaborate with all the municipalities on the Northeast Avalon to create a collaborative approach to this issue. A lot of employees of companies contracted by the city aren't necessarily from the city, um, so their cost of living isn't always the same. Um, this highlights the need to explore cost shared labor and infrastructure investment too, to reflect the ways that residents on the Northeast Avalon actually live their lives across municipal boundaries. Um, and this also speaks to the need for regional governance and a regional lens to addressing systemic issues like this. Thanks, Jess. I didn't even need to give you your 30 second warning that is uh, setting the tone for the night. We will see. All right. Uh, so the next uh, answer on this question around uh, a living wage for city employees and subcontractors uh, goes to Maggie Burton. Uh, Maggie, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Um, so first of all, uh, can you hear me OK? Yep. OK. I support a living wage for everybody in the city, uh, be it through the city or like through the city as an employer or provincially through mandated legislation for, for everybody. So I'll just say that right off the bat. And I uh, definitely support a living wage policy at the city. I think there are some practical issues we'd have to work collaboratively, collaboratively with staff on. And um, one, of the, one of the examples actually just, just mentioned a social procurement policy. So myself and others have already asked that staff do the work to develop that. And as far as I know, it's underway. So I think that that's a fabulous idea and getting that helps us get more money back into the pockets of people who work with social enterprises and then they can spend it on food and everything else that they want. Um, so yeah, very few of the city's employees are currently paid less than a living wage. For the most part, um, people are unionized and uh, a living wage policy would have to go through collective bargaining. Um, but for contractors and for, well, for direct or indirect contracted work, the city's uh, significant subcontracts are made through a public tendering process, which is governed by that legislation, of course. 
Um, so I'd want to talk to the lawyers and public work staff, especially at the city, about how that living wage policy would interact with the tendering process, because maybe there's something we'd have to tweak there. It doesn't always um, work the way you might expect. <laughs> um, but yeah, living wage is super important. And, you know, it, for myself, I've worked a lot of jobs that have been nowhere near close to living wage. And I've often had five to six jobs at a time. Before council I was on, I had about six jobs and uh, two little kids to feed. So I just want to recognize that it's extremely important that people get paid enough so that they can support their families and live here in the city. Thanks very much, Maggie. Uh, the next answer goes to Ron Ellsworth. So Ron, over to you. Uh, you have two minutes on a living wage for city employees and city contractors. Go for it. Uh, good evening, Josh. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you to all the folks at Happy Cities for uh, organizing this this evening and for all the work you guys do in the community. I certainly appreciate all the effort you guys put in and uh, your goal of helping to make our city a better place. So your time and your energy is appreciated, guys. Uh, my answer is very simple, Josh. The answer is yes. Uh, everybody has a right to have a living wage. We can preamble this all we want. We can talk around it all we want. Basically, either we support it or we don't. Uh, I do support it. A lot of my work in the community is done uh, within community centers and low-income economic neighborhoods. So I understand the struggles of not being able to get a meaningful um, wage. But we also need to look deeper. Uh, we need to look at why people struggle to get meaningful employment. Uh, we must work as a community um, to remove those barriers for people, to allow individuals to find meaningful employment and allow the individual to have a good quality of life. Because, you know, the more people who have a good quality of life, the better community we have, the less struggles we have, and the better opportunity we have to build a community uh, onto itself, supporting itself. So the short answer is yes, I support the initiative. Thanks, Ron. And thanks, everybody, for being very good about time tonight. I am, I am impressed. I moderate a lot of things. I am having to do less work than I usually do. Um, so just for folks who might be joining us uh, in, a, in the call more recently, uh, I'm going to repeat the question uh, before we go to our next person, who is Mark Howes. So the question comes from the folks at the St. John's Food Policy Council and, and elites. From the St. John's Food Assessment, people of all incomes and ages across the city recognize that increased income is the most needed change to improve food access. Where a living wage in St. John's is calculated as 1885 an hour, would you support the city of St. John's in adopting a living wage policy to ensure firms contracted directly or subcontracted by the city to provide services paid their employees a living wage? That is the question. The, this answer goes to Mark House. Mark, you have two minutes. Go for it. Hi, thanks, Josh. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to speak here this evening. And now I'd like to thank everybody at Happy City for setting up this forum for us to be able to share our opinions. Um, I think I, I would well, I, I would like to say that I absolutely absolutely do support advocating for a municipal living wage because uh, because it is implementing a municipal living wage policy is a way that local governments can directly improve residents, lit lives, and put widely held community values into practice. So I'm very much behind that. Um, most people agree that hard work should be rewarded with adequate pay and benefits, and that people working full-time should not be stuck living in poverty. Um, a municipal living wage policy can help ensure that community values about fair employment practices are reflected in city contracts and that public initiatives aren't being subsidized by poverty wages. Uh, poverty is a major contributor to the many, many of the problems that affect the overall quality of life in our communities and put strain on public resources. So therefore public livable incomes and benefits not only leads to better lives for employees and their families, but also reduces the strain on emergency medical care, policing, food banks, housing programs, drug and alcohol programs, and other public services. So I'm all about supporting local business. And if there, if there isn't enough money to go around for even basic needs of residents to support themselves, they will not be able to even think about supporting the local economy. We need to do better in that regard. And failure to tackle the poverty and exclusion facing millions of families and their children is not only socially reprehensible, but will also weigh heavily on countries' capacity to sustain economic growth in years to come. 
So that is where I stand on this issue. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, last up on this question of a living wage for city employees and contractors is uh, Sandy Hickman. Uh, so Sandy, over to you. Uh, two minutes on a living wage. Go for it. You're on mute there, Sandy. There Chris, you go. Sorry. No hey, worries. Gosh, and uh, thank you to Happy City for everything you do and for this opportunity. Um, um, I would first of all state that I would love to see a, an increase in the minimum wage to a living wage. Um, what that is, where that that ends up, it would is beyond the city's purview. But I certainly support a living wage provincially, uh, which would apply, of course, to St. John's. Now, as to your question, I'm open to discussion as to how the policy would work, but is, it is a difficult thing for any government, especially local government, uh, which has by far the lowest proportion of the tax dollar, to show bias towards one particular supplier or provider. Provisions under the Procurement Act do not allow for any such judgment. It is illegal under the Act for one, a local government to take anything but the lowest bidder, and two, show favoritism to anyone, any one bidder. Further elected officials have no role to play in procurement other than officially approve at a public meeting. Now, having said all that, is there a way to ensure certain firms that provide services, certain services are paid a fair wage, are paying a fair wage? Uh, difficult task, but I think we need to come up with a social procurement policy and policies that uh, encourage and support that the contractors, uh, builders, uh, and, sorry, bidders, should be involved in this. This has to be policy. It has to be firmed up. There's no question about that. Um, so I'm ensuring, uh, I'm saying that by ensuring appropriate outsourcing and, and the competitive bid process at the same time, this will ensure the city can still get competitive bids. But it is incumbent upon the city to come up with this such a social procurement policy that asks the question, what is the rate of pay that you're offering your employees? Thank you. And thank you, Sandy. That wraps up our first question. Thank you all for your considered responses. We're going to move on to the next one now. Uh, keep things moving briskly here. Uh, we have a different order of respondents, but it'll work the same way. Two minutes on, on the question for each person. Uh, and so the question is uh, around accessibility, specifically other than modifications of city-run buildings to enable and improve physical, physical accessibility, what should council do to make our city more accessible from a cross-disability perspective? And the first answer on this, two minutes, goes to Mark House. So Mark, over to you. Thanks again, Josh. Um, well, uh, having to, uh, wanting to support uh, uh, um, cross-disability in the city, the basic right of people with disabilities to control and direct their own lives, to participate in, actively in society is key. They minimize reliance on others in decision-making and in performance of everyday activities, and they're limited only in the same ways that people without disabilities are limited. So the greatest degree of choice about where to live or who they live with how to live and how to use the time. Taking risks to succeed or fail and taking responsibility for their own decisions should be up to the, the, the disabled individual. Uh, the, the social roles that they play, working, owning a home, raising a family, engaging in leisure and recreational activities and participating to the extent one chooses to all aspects of human life. So I think um, I'm more about supporting independent living centers or centers for independent living. Uh, they're consumer controlled, uh, community-based, uh, private nonprofit agencies, which uh, really help out in these situations. They're operated by people with, di with disabilities and they provide independent living services. They empower people with all types of disabilities to live more independently and have control over their lives. So these independent living centers governing board includes in the majority of people who are living with these disabilities. So these people could best help out with people with the with this, the disabilities in how that they can carry on. They, they share their successes, they help decide what's best for them, and they emphasize services to cross disability consumer population. And they can peer model. They they can they they understand where the uh, person with the disability comes from. Um, 
provision and core services as information and referral, peer counseling, independent living skills training, individual individual advocacy, and educate community advocacy. So the Thanks, advocacy, the right? Okay. That's time now. Uh, I'm going to be ruthless on my two minutes, but sure, uh, but thank you. Um, the next because it was. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, the uh, the next uh, answer on this question around uh, what the city could do, what council could do to make our city more accessible from across disability perspective is going to Jess Puddister. So Jess, you have two minutes on the clock, over to you. Thanks. Um, first, I wanna start by acknowledging um, the time and effort uh, of community members like Lisa Walters, Anne Malone, and Mandy Penny, um, who I've, I'm, I've spoken to throughout the campaign. I've learned a great deal from them about um, the needs of disabled people and how the city can do better uh, to support disabled people. Um, so I've got a lot about this issue in my platform. Um, so I'm just gonna list some of the things from my platform. Um, first, I'd like to collaborate with Newfoundland Power to reposition light poles out of the right of way um, and the required passable width of walkways for pedestrians. This is a, an issue that I've seen all over the city when I've been knocking on doors. And once you see it, you, you see it everywhere. Like you can't not see it. Um, I think that we should possibly reassess the criteria for installing crosswalks to facilitate meeting pedestrian needs and making sure that when we have crosswalks, we've got curb cuts to meet those crosswalks on either side um, for barrier free movement from the street up onto the sidewalk. Um, I think prioritizing an increase to both the pace of sidewalk snow clearing and the streets that receive the service, um, that's got to be included in budget 2022. Um, we also could do, we could see more roadside benches to provide rest stops for folks who are moving around the city, either on foot or, or with mobility aids. Um, I think we can integrate characteristics and design principles that support aging in place. Um, and that means a range of housing types, year round walkability and accessibility, green space and connectivity. I'd like to introduce wayfinding signposts on city trails, green spaces, and rights of way to amplify awareness and usage of green space corridors, um, and also ensure gaps exist within vehicle barricades. Like I've been in neighborhoods where there's been chains across the entry entryways to parks, and you have to like lift your legs quite high to get over that chain to get into the park, and that's that's not accessible and doesn't have to be that way. Um, and it's the same for some of the entry points for the, the pedestrian mall. Um, and just I, that is time on your two minutes. Cool. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but we are going to move on to the next uh, respondent on this question, uh, which is Sandy Hickman. So um, I'll uh, repeat the question just as a refresh, which is other than modifications of city run buildings to enable or improve accessibility, what should council do to make our city more accessible from a cross disability perspective? So Sandy, two minutes on the clock, go for it. Thank you, Josh, an important area of concern. And this covers all aspects, of course, of includes not just physical standards. And uh, we've heard some comments already. Uh, the city, of course, so uh, has been following national building code and ascribes to the concept of universal design for its facilities. Uh, certainly it's new facilities uh, and existing buildings. Accessibility concerns are being addressed. And in the case of two of our recreation centers, rather than renovate and, and adjust, we replaced. Uh, Mew Center and Paul Reynolds Center, of course, are a much higher standard for universal accessibility. Uh, we've also taken great steps in other areas. Uh, curb cuts, uh, much lower slope, uh, wider openings, intersections and crosswalks. Uh, if you look at Water Street, that's exactly what's happening down there. It's much more accessible than the, the old standards. Uh, step pads are, have been installed over the years of crosswalks to assist the visually impaired. And one of the things that is fairly new is a program of cro new crosswalk signal technology, which offers visually impaired uh, a, an app to call for the crossing sequence uh, with an audible signal, of course. So the city has undertaken a lot of these things and it has to do more, has to continue the good things it's doing and more intersections, more streets, and uh, I think that's the first step. Uh, we also need our traffic engineers to work with our recreation staff that are involved in serving the special needs populations to research the latest technology and work with especially community organizations as they offer probably more expertise than we have and will often be much more knowledgeable and aware of leading edge technology. 
So that's very important for the city to be doing that. So uh, the research, this kind of research will allow the city to be on target for enhancements to buildings, civil works, and other concerns that impact people with disabilities. But I also want to, of course, mention that uh, the Metrobus uh, can move forward, I think, into the modern era with things such as uh, uh, audible notations uh, for bus stops and uh, other technology that is out there. All right. And, and that's time. Uh, good end sentence there. And uh, next person up on this question of accessibility is Maggie Burton. So Maggie, uh, the clock is reset. You have two minutes on uh, what the city could do. So over to you. Thanks, Josh. So I firmly believe that everyone ought to be able to access, use, and engage with buildings and services regardless of their age, their ability, their income, their race, or their gender. Um, so it's not, um, it's not happening right now, unfortunately. It's essential that the city ensure our own services are acceptable and accessible. So that has to be done um, first and foremost. I'm grateful to fellow Canada Anne Malone and many other incredible uh, disability advocates in St. John's for their work. And um, some people have already mentioned some others. And I really do believe that nothing about us without us should be more than just a slogan and accessibility can't be an afterthought. It has to be a commitment. In my first term, we've integrated the city's inclusion advisory committee into a wider range of decision making and ensured that all of our major infrastructure projects are reviewed by them before decisions are made. So I think that's really great. We've also added to and expanded the role of that committee and I've, I, um, I think we can continue to, um, to work on that as well. And from my conversations with advocates within the community, I think that the top outcomes by 2025 for me would be ensuring equitable trail access is in place and um, as well as introducing Metrobus stop announcements and improving the number of accessible transit, um, accessible Metro buses that are there and improving the, um, the paratransit system as well. I also think that we can make improvements to the pedestrian mall and remove sidewalk obstructions, whatever they may be and fix curb cuts. Um, I, can th I think we can also focus on ensuring that private and public uh, accessible housing units are either approved or financed depending on the situation. And um, yeah, these changes are all within municipal control and they would significantly improve accessibility across the, the entire city. And of course, I'll continue to listen and learn from members of the able, diverse and disability community and um, I hope to make more improvements during this term. Thanks, Maggie. And the last uh, response to this question around uh, what council can do to make the city more accessible goes to Ron Ellsworth. So Ron, whenever you are ready, uh, two minutes on accessibility, go for it. Uh, thanks, Josh. Obviously a stronger commitment to universal design is one of the keys to move the city forward. Now, we're all looking at it from the same viewpoint. We're all looking at it from the same lens. So I understand that from a moving forward point of view but the reality is we also need to work backwards and apply the universal design concepts, techniques, not only the structures, but everything that we do in the city. The city keeps talking about all the great work that's being done, but yet we've seen the pedestrian mall again fail when it came to being open up and accessibility being primary on the lens to make sure it's there. I'm not sure why advocates in the community have to go back every time and go back and raise this issue that it got missed this time, it got missed the last time. It just means we're not paying attention. What I would do, Josh, is I would mandate all council members, senior staff, to do a mandatory training to be educated and to learn about accessibility, what accessibility actually means, and what's actually a daily challenge for people uh, to overcome in accessibility. We have an aging population along with uh, many in our community facing challenges. And this is only going to get stronger and more uh, needs and resources dedicated to it. It's only when decision makers uh, have a good understanding can you make good decisions towards accomplishing a more accessible community. My long service in the community, working in accessibility, championing causes, moving things forward is well known. I make no excuse for that. I've had great champions in the community alongside of me, uh, the late Johnny Dunn, Bill Westcott, uh, Tina Cease Witt, and Susan Ralph, to name a few. It's very sad that such a small portion of the city's budget is allocated to dealing with accessibility issues. For me, Josh, I'll continue to listen, to learn, and to be educated on the challenges that are facing the members of our community. Thanks, Ron, and uh, thanks to all the candidates for your thoughtful responses on that, on that question. We're gonna move on now to our, our next question uh, and our next candidate shuffle here. 
Uh, so the next question is around community groups, and it comes uh, as all these questions do uh, from the community. So uh, the question is, over the past few years, the city has started to require prohibitively expensive insurance coverage as part of receiving permits for community events and other initiatives on city property. How would you address this? And are there other ways you would like to see the city support community and neighborhood groups? Uh, and the first response on this goes to Sandy Hickman. Sandy, you have two minutes. Over to you. Thanks, Joss. Uh, yes, first of all, let's note the city mandates all groups using city facilities protect themselves and, of course, taxpayers' assets. This is a normal practice in municipalities, and it's critical that individuals involved have protection against liability. Uh, now, indeed, the cost is negligible for regular user groups or large groups, as this would be blended into their overall policy and or could be extended at little or no cost. But one-off events run by nonprofits or individuals and it can be a concern, as you've noticed. But the city does have a program called User Group Insurance, which offers affordable rates. For instance, a small group under 25 participants would pay $35. Um, but these massive insurance costs uh, are, are really non applicable, as I said, to the small scale events. But no matter, this is a litigious society that we live in, and the city would be irresponsible if it didn't ensure volunteer organizers were protected. Uh, to move on from insurance, the city does assist in other ways, but I feel that we're, we need to ramp some of this up. And one of those ways is through staff time. Our professional staff cover all areas and have a great deal of expertise and leadership in their fields. This has to be enhanced, I think, to take a little more off the shoulders of volunteers. Our staff uh, have the time, they have the expertise, they can get a little bit more involved, I think, and help some of the organizations. And I also want to point out one other very important thing that we do as a city, and that is provide community grants. Uh, this is a huge help in providing seed money to organizations and individuals such as, such as artists, gives them a kickstart, and provides credibility in approaching the corporate sector and the federal and provincial governments. Quite often, it's both financial support and endorsement is a requirement for accessing further funding. My position on this is clear, and I've stated many times that I feel it's the best money we spend as the organizations have the expertise in their areas, they can undertake the work much more cheaply and effectively than the city ever could. But I also have maintained that we should be slowly topping up this program and up the amount of each organization. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. And that's time. Ron Ellsworth is next. Uh, so Ron, over to you um, around support for community groups and, and the barrier that they face with, uh, with insurance. So Ron, you have two minutes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, as has been alluded by previous speakers, uh, it's not necessarily the cost of the insurance itself, but it's also the process people got to go through, the red tape, the paperwork, figure who they got to go see, who they got to get permits from, all those things. So it's not just the cost of the insurance, it's the red tape that we've created. Obviously, as a city, we got a, a liability issue that we need to maintain and look after. Uh, so, you know, certainly need to be able to go through those pieces. Uh, we need to work to remove those barriers. We need to provide assistance and where groups are, are trying to get into the community and, and access facilities. Uh, why are we making it harder for people to give back to our community is the question. And this is not only an issue for the city St. John's. It's like, you know, I volunteered in schools, I've coached in schools, and same challenge, same issue. With liability seems to be the driving force, and we forget what we're trying to do in our community by servicing our community. Uh, we need to work with community, group, com community groups, many of them who are volunteers uh, working to make our community a better place, we should be able to purchase a blanket policy that would assist the organizations rather than have them come in and come in with another application, another application, another application. Uh, you know, for example, when I was on council previously, if any smaller groups were looking access to for meetings, I would actually book the meeting in my name, I would attend the meeting, therefore they were covered then because it was a council uh, piece. I've been volunteering in the Shea Heights Community Center for about 15 years. I sit on the board in Shea Heights, and we look after uh, uh, events in the community in Shea Heights. How we get around it up there is a board member attends the event, is a board sanctioned event, and therefore we get away from the issue about insurance and liability. So there's ways we can find solutions if we want to. If we want to make it easier for the community groups, we can find those solutions and working together. So it's through collaboration, meaningful engagement, we, we can understand the challenges and remove the barriers. Thank you, Ron. 
Uh, the third response on this question around uh, support for community groups and, and uh, particularly barriers they face around insurance goes to Maggie Burton. So Maggie, over to you, two minutes. Thank you, Josh. So I've talked to lots of community groups and individuals within them um, on, about this issue over the years, and I know it's a, it's a very frustrating one for sure. We are really fortunate at the city to be able to work with so many active community and neighborhood groups, such as the Georgetown Neighborhood Association, my faith, um, whose engagement and participation makes our city a better place for everybody to live and work and play. At the same time, it is really important to ensure that these groups and the city are protected against any potential liability. So the groups themselves are, um, you know, it's really, really, really important. I can't overstate it that um, people have appropriate insurance to cover themselves in the event of an unfortunate incident. So the root of this problem, of course, is that provincial and federal governments provide limited assistance for injury victims. When someone gets hurt in an, at an event, they can actually lose their career and require around the clock care. And that can cost easily millions of dollars on the, on the, uh, the taxpayer. And our liability rules mean that event hosts are often found responsible for that loss rather than the social safety net itself. The city is happy to make its spaces available to community groups at uh, for as low as a cost as we possibly can. And, um, but we do expect groups to cover the liability risk associated with their event. Many groups already have that commercial general liability insurance that covers risks. And for those that don't have insurance, we do have a special assistance program that reduces the cost as much as we can. That cost depends on the event, how many people are there, uh, if you have alcohol or not. Insuring an event with like 400 people in alcohol costs 300 bucks about that and no alcohol costs about $35. Um, during this term on council, we reversed the previous council's decision to charge uh, money for using the foreign green room, so that made one extra space available for the public. Anyway, I think there's a lot to improve about the city, but I think that our approach on this is actually quite reasonable. I'd rather use the money uh, to improve sidewalks and clearing. Thank you, Maggie. I'll repeat the question. Uh, just uh, were a few uh, few answers in here. So uh, the question was: Over the past few years, the city has started to require prohibitively expensive uh, insurance coverage as part of receiving permits for community events and other initiatives on city property. Uh, how would you address this? And are there other ways you would like to see the city support community and neighborhood groups? The next response goes to Jess Puddister. Jess, you have two minutes. Go for it. Thanks. Um, so I reached out to a friend of mine who works in insurance um, to get their perspective on this question, and they, it was really a helpful discussion for me. Um, so in the past three to five years, we've been in what's called a hard market. And that means it's not only extremely expensive, but it's also limited in coverage. Um, so when you're looking for insurance that needs to cover requirements, you can be limited in your options of what carrier to go with. Um, this isn't the fault of the city, but it's also still very frustrating for the community, and we do have to find a solution. Um, I'd like to look into what kind of coverage is required. Like, is it reasonable? We have staff whose job it is to research and advise on policy in this area. Um, I actually tried to track down Betty Clark today. She's the city's risk manager, um, but it, I didn't have any luck today. Um, you know, I think city property should be accessible for community organizing, and I'm definitely committed to exploring all avenues and making that a reality. Um, the good news is that the market is starting to soften, it's showing very early signs of that, and when it does, prices will go down some and coverage should broaden. Um, I'd like to look at what is working well for more established groups to make sure that all community and neighborhood groups looking to use city property have a comprehensive list of places to look for insurance. Um, and in terms of supporting the community and, neighbor and neighborhood groups expand in our city, I'd like to see ward councillors um, nurture like the initiation of community groups and, and find key people in their ward to be involved and promote things like neighborhood associations, recreation, cleanups, and other events. And I really hope I get the opportunity to support ward councillors in this kind of effort. Thank you, Jess. And the final answer on this question around support for neighborhood groups uh, and overcoming barriers around liability goes to Mark House. So Mark, uh, whenever you are up and ready, just waiting for you to pop up on the screen. There you are. Um, over to you, you have two minutes, go for it. All right, thanks, Josh. Um, well, as everybody has already said that we live in a world now where it all comes down to liability, 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 and risk management. And so the city needs to protect itself from liability and as well as everybody that uses city facilities. Um, the uh, city needs to protect its facilities just like a business does. And even though there've been a so few lawsuits that have come you know, not against nonprofits or the other way around, uh, it hasn't happened very often, but still the insurance 
is necessary to be had. Uh, even though there have been a few, I'm uh, sorry, uh, the, the city owns several properties that need that are used by the community, and uh, they need to be able to be able to be used in in more initiatives in that in that way. A community group pays insurance for their own coverage while using the facility for their own protection. So they're even though it might be frustrating for them, um, the facility uh, using the facility, they need to protect themselves. Uh, and the money is not, you know, obviously the money doesn't go to the city coffers, but it goes to the insurance company. So the city is limited in the, in the amount of how much money is, caught, is charged. Um, we, we live in an age where public liability is a huge issue, and it is a necessity as well as a hindrance for everyone. The city is limited in finding an alternative that will satisfy everyone, but I'm sure by working together, we can find a more reasonable solution. The city does have some assistance programs and they can waive other potential fees in lieu of a donation, such like, like that. And community groups could possibly get together and share costs of a facility while maintaining appropriate distance and so on. So th those several things about, uh, about the regard of insurance. Thank you. And thank you, Mark, and thanks to all the uh, the candidates for their answers on that question. From uh, from insurance and community facilities, we are moving on to public <laughs> transit, another big issue, uh, always at election time. Um, so I will start with the question. Uh, consultants hired to study our transit system pre-COVID found that St. John's has a worse transit coverage than 10 other comparable Canadian cities and called for improvements like free transit for school students and frequency improvements that would eventually cost an extra $2 million a year. In addition, the city is currently drafting plans to switch to electric buses. The federal government won't pay for more diesel buses much longer. While this will save money long term, it costs more to buy each bus. There will be training and other costs. The city has, furthermore, currently chosen to cut half a million dollars from Metrobus's budget, uh, which does seem certain to make the service worse than it already is. Do you feel this is necessary, or would you find the money needed to implement the improvements that have been suggested by that review? Um, so that mouthful of a question, uh, the first answer goes to Maggie Burton. Maggie, you have two minutes on the clock. Over to you on public transit. Thank you, Josh. So first of all, every resident in the city deserves to be able to get around the city safely. And for a lot of people, that's gonna require a better public transit system. To be a vibrant modern city, we need an interconnected active transport and public transit network. And they both have to come, I think, side by side so that people can leave their house, uh, get to the bus stop and then get to their destination and get home. So I hope people see a little bit more these days about how being able to get out of your house in the winter time, for example, is, is completely integral to a functional transit system. St. John's wasn't designed or built for public transit, but it absolutely has great routes and uh, areas that could be further enhanced and some areas that could, I think, use a lot of, um, of help developing a transit culture around them. But the problem that we have is that our service on those routes is very infrequent. We're operating only about half as many buses as we did 30 years ago. Not many people know that, even though the city has massively expanded. With bad service like that, Metrobus is only getting a fraction of the ridership that we might on our 1400 kilometers of roads. Um, this is a big opportunity for us, so I think that we can improve service on high potential routes and ridership and ticket revenue would go up and that would help further subsidize things like electrification. The initial service increase pays for itself. That's what happened with a recent budget cut. So council didn't cut service levels. It actually improved them in many respects. Increasing ticket revenue allowed us to cut the subsidy. I think it would have been wiser to reinvest those savings in Metrobus itself and to implement the frequent transit network. I'm hoping that in the next year we'll be able to implement that FTN phase one, the frequent transit network phase one, and that would double frequencies on the five key routes in the recommendations of the consultants review that was mentioned in the question. So that's step one and I, I can't wait to go from there. Thank you, Maggie. All right, the next response on uh, transit uh, service improvements uh, and uh, the results of the consultant report goes to Sandy Hickman. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Certainly transit is a key service in any city our size. I, and I will agree we don't have the best service, but it has been improving in many ways. Uh, the question actually throws several issues at us, but let me first clarify that Metrobus is moving towards electric buses down the road, but first of all is developing a plan towards that. And I do understand that there are various studies that have criticism offered, but 
They're a little bit unfair down to the parameters included uh, topography, ancient road patterns, narrow single lane roads, heavy wind, sodden, heavy drifting snow as factors. It, uh, perhaps some of them did include those parameters, I don't know. These factors constrain our, constrain our system and require ingenuity and unfortunately money to overcome. I don't know where Metrobus ranks in terms of percent subsidy, but it's crept up over the years to the point where it is quite concerning. So we have a lot of work to do and by creating a more efficient service, it will actually help cut down on the subsidy. One of the things I've always maintained is that the routes are part of the problem. There's too many routes, not enough frequency, and maybe not the right routes. The proposal for a street, free stu student access is an excellent one, and increased frequency as well. But this has to be done with the review of setting these routes so that they link better east-west and north-south with links between. But they have to have efficient timing of transfers uh, express routes at rush hours along these various routes, feeder routes using perhaps smaller buses, uh, more shelters, uh, faster, better snow clearing. Um, I think late night on-call buses may work in certain routes as opposed to having an empty bus going back and forth. Um, auditory cues I mentioned and digital bus signage that show arrival times would be important. Two other key concerns, the lack of support and subsidy of routes by neighboring communities has been mentioned earlier. This is where many transportation systems achieve success as the express routes that are efficient and closer to being money-making ventures. So a regional system makes a lot of sense. I was gonna mention the U-Pass at month, but I won't. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy, that's time. Um, next one up on uh, public transit uh, and specifically around uh, implementation or not of service improvements uh, is Mark House. So Mark, over to you uh, with uh, two minutes on the clock. Go for it. Thanks. Um, I think public transit should be a main focus for improving our city um, by increasing imp and improving service on our city streets. It solves several other problems citizens want the city to address. So such as protecting the environment, uh, neighborhood traffic and speed calming, fewer cars means less danger to pedestrians and cyclists, etc. Um, I think electric public transit is, is coming and coming faster than we realize, and it's here to stay. And we need to find ways and means to acquire these vehicles without putting too much pressure on a very delicate system of sharing limited financial resources. Um, there's very little money to go around right now, and the, and the province faces an unprecedented deficit, and the city faces a budget shortfall and is legally required to maintain a balanced budget. Uh, the current council has to cut programs and or services to find these funds. Therefore, hence the $500,000 taken from, taken from public transit, as an example. I'm not saying that, that transit is the right place to find these funds, but the question is where else can we look that causes the least amount of pain for everyone? And we can put more electric buses on the roads, but that can't easily happen unless residents use this and support public transit and that with a cut down on the subsidy. Thank you. And thank you, Mark. The next answer on this question around uh, public transit and whether or not to resource service improvements uh, goes to Ron Ellsworth. Ron, over to you. Uh, thanks again, Josh. Uh, we need to strengthen our relationship with our neighboring municipalities we also need to have a relationship with the provincial government and MUN. By increasing ridership, we increase efficiencies, and then by increasing efficiencies, we increase ridership. This will work towards lowering the cost of taxpayers, at the same time making improvements uh, to the system. For example, within the city, can we use Metrobus to transport the older students to and from school, rather than have a duplication of bus services on the street? We certainly need to move forward with electric buses and vehicles in general. So let's continue to build the infrastructure that will allow us to be ready. We also need to look at rapid transit. I've been championing rapid transit since 2009. This will move people quickly uh, to the larger demand areas within the city. For example, the university, malls, hospitals, and downtown. By having the rapid transit, you'll have more people willing to use the system because it's more effective and more efficient. With regards to cutting to 500,000, First, you need to look at the budget versus actual spend. Just because we reduce the budget doesn't mean we're reducing services. For those out there who keep saying the only way to save money is to reduce services, 
don't really understand finance and budgeting. What we need to do is we need to roll up our sleeves, we need to get at the table, and we need to find efficiencies. The better service that we provide, the more people are going to be riding the buses. But it's not a one-time event. It's not a one-time uh, exercise. This needs to be a continuous exercise. That we are a changing, evolving community, and we may stay current on best practices. When we did the budget in 2016, 2017, we laid out a process to go through this and maintain and keep watching the money you spend and the services you provide. And I don't think this council is really focused as much as it should on that process. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Ron. And the final answer on this question, which is around whether uh, candidates feel that the, the cut to Metrobus was necessary or uh, the money should be found to implement the uh, suggested improvements, the final answer goes to Jess Puddister. So Jess, over to you, two minutes on the clock. It's all yours. No doubt budget choices are tough, um, but it was the wrong choice to cut a half million dollars to Metrobus budget last December. This is a core service. It's an integral part of transportation equity in St. John's. It's simply not possible for low income households to own a car. And it is a collective responsibility we all share to make sure that people can move freely and safely around the city. I spoke to a man on Pleasant Street two days ago, and he told me that employers generally have to accept that if an employee doesn't own a car, they're probably going to be late for their shift once a week or more during the winter, especially. Um, and this really hurts people's credibility and their ability to elevate themselves out of poverty. Um, we really have to do better. Um, one of the biggest issues we face in trying to address this is car culture. We invest so much money in the infrastructure required to support private vehicle ownership and movement through sprawl development. Um, and it's not just about the upfront cost of installation, but operation, maintenance, and renewal for our streets too. Taxpayers often don't realize, but they're, subsidi they're subsidizing car culture through planning and budget choices at the council table. Um, we need to make a, a culture shift. One thing we can do is make it free for high school students to take the bus. Um, the city of Kingston does this. And when they did increase ridership from 30,000 up to 600,000, I'd love to get back to the bargaining table with Munsu to reassess how we can make a U-pass pa possible for Mun um, students, faculty, and staff. And we really need to change the narrative that this would be on the backs of students. It makes so much sense for people traveling to and from a similar space to use transit. Like so many people in the city are employed or go to school on the parkway. Um, and the same could be said for provincial government and city staff. Um, streamlining usage for large groups of people like this would really up our game in transit in St. John's and the investment that we would have access to to grow transit in the city. And thank you, Jess, and thanks to all of the candidates for their thoughtful answers around public transit. Uh, we are continuing on the theme of difficult financial choices for our last question of this forum. Um, so I will read the question and then we will go for one more round with, uh, with our candidates tonight. So the question is, uh, once again, submitted by, by one of, uh, one of the broader Happy City community, folks we reach, between snowmageddon, COVID-19 costs, and federally required water treatment improvements, St. John's will be looking at a budget crunch during your term should you be elected. Many, however, are also calling for service improvements, and the city cannot legally run a deficit. What values will guide how you balance taxation and spending? What existing services would you be willing to reduce or eliminate to support your priorities? And the first answer on this goes to Ron Ellsworth. So Ron, two minutes for you on, uh, on spending priorities. Go for it. Thanks, Josh. Once again, reducing costs does not mean reducing services. A prime example of this is when I was on council, when we brought down the budget in 2016, 2017, we removed approximately $19 million out of the budget cycle without any major impacts on services. Through a strong working relationship with council, management staff, and our unions, plus our community, we can all continue to work as a group to find efficiencies, improve best practices, and continue to find more efficient ways of doing and providing services. Once again, it's about rolling your sleeves up, getting at the table, and going through the budget item by item, and find efficiencies alongside of our staff. Josh, in closing, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Happy City Group Thank all the people who joined us this evening and congratulate Mayor Breen, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Leary, uh, Councilor Fraud uh, for under acclamations. 
I would also like to thank all my uh, fellow candidates for putting their names forward uh, to represent the best city ever. Stay safe, everyone, and be careful on the campaign trail. Thanks, Ron. Next up if on this question of budgetary priorities uh, is Mark House. So Mark, over to you for your, uh, your final answer tonight. You have two minutes to talk about what values would guide you and how you would balance taxation and spending. Go for it. Thanks, Josh. Um, I've been hearing many concerns um, from residents and community groups that have and that uh, have and the causes they stand for. Um, an example is the St. John's Regional Fire Department. Uh, I had a meeting with a, a few of them earlier this week, and while I was there, one of their staff was being treated by their medics for a possible heart attack. They had to wait 45 minutes for an ambulance to arrive, and when they did arrive, it came from an ambulance company in Holyrood. So, so this resources have been stretched and they're in real dire need of, uh, of coming together. Uh, the meeting was cut short because one of the guys ran out because of the fire alarm. And the other one that I was meeting with had to fill in for the guy who was having a heart attack because they were short staffed. So this is obviously not a good situation due to budget constraints. I also recognize that each of these types of concerns is absolutely valid. Everyone that has expressed concerns to me, they, their, their validity, validity, and I 100% agree with what these groups feel needs to be accomplished for their cause or the concern. But we also have to realize mm -hmm. that to address each and every concern to the satisfaction of all the residents is to be, uh, is a fiscally challenging and near impossible thing to do. For example, if a significant portion of the budget is spent in snow clearing, we would have less money in other areas. And as long as St. John's exists, snow clearing is always going to be a complicated issue unless we can stop the snow from falling. Uh, it is a reality we deal with every winter and, and that will not change. And people don't like the situation and I am one of those people, but we love our city because we choose to live here. And we have to be able to put up with the pain of sometimes not having our streets clear the way we want them to be. And we all want what is best for our families, our friends, and ourselves. No one wants to hurt the other because that goes against the idea of building a better city. We can't do better. We can do better. Thank you, Mark. And next up is Jess Puddister. Jess, uh, over to you for two minutes on the values that will guide how you balance taxation and spending, and how would you uh, prioritize different services whenever you're ready. Okay, um, so I think it's important to point out that the information we currently have access to about the budget as residents isn't very detailed. Um, it's also important to remember that one, the, 26, the 2016 efficiency review was quite serious and deep. And two, the city doesn't have an asset management plan. Um, one of the questions I have that I don't have enough data on is whether a cost of service study has been done on everything the city does and what services are being subsidized versus what could have larger user fees to cover the actual cost of service. Um, I believe that this was done a few years ago with respect to fixing residential water and sewer connections. Um, but what about water metering? This is something that's really common across Canada, and we know that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are some of the highest consumers of water in the country. It costs a lot of money to treat and deliver potable water through the distribution system. And long term, I don't think it makes sense to have a flat fee for this. We should incentivize water con conservation, which would actually save us a lot of money. Um, it would also be awesome to do an audit to understand how municipally owned spaces are being used right now and how we could better use them. Can we rent out underused spaces to local businesses, agencies, or community groups? Um, also, let's get serious about securing grants in lieu, um, lieu of taxes from the provincial government for their properties within municipal boundaries. The overwhelming majority of Canadian municipalities receive this revenue stream. Um, bottom line, a city budget doesn't work for the community if it doesn't work for the most vulnerable. I feel that there are efficiencies that can be found within the working relationship between the city and the provincial government, in terms of service delivery and potential revenue options. Um, I'm committed to limiting city spending by incentivizing density over sprawl. It's not realistic to say that an increase in taxation is out of the question, but it should be an absolute last resort. If we can be courageous and dedicated to long-term master planning that promotes mixed use development, we can provide high quality services without needing to resort to tax increase. 
Thanks, Jess. That is two minutes to the second. And we are over uh, to Sandy Hickman for uh, the next response on uh, what values would guide you on how you balance taxation and spending. What existing services would you be willing to reduce or eliminate to support your priorities? Uh, Sandy, two minutes on the clock. Go for it. Thank you, Jess. Uh, this will require a careful consideration of all programs and services and all sources of revenue. Uh, but let's face it, the vast majority of revenue comes from property taxes, which can be called redundant, I suppose you could say. As you know, the preamble to your question, there are costs on the horizon the city will have no control over, such as the secondary sewage treatment. This is going to add several million dollars a year to our annual operating and debt costs. This will necessitate an increase in the water tax, so we want to avoid other tax increases. I am pleased. Sandy, I think we lost your mic there. Oh, you might have just muted yourself. You go ahead now. Okay, let's go. You're back. So, um, um, I don't, or, anyway, um, like most people, I do not want to see further tax increases, and I'm pledging not to support any tax increases. Uh, we must ensure young families, low-income earners, and the rapidly growing pensioner sector can afford to live in St. John's, as they have other growing financial stresses. We all know that. But Let's also be clear, another and the best way to avoid tax increases is to have a growing tax base. For many years, growth kept up with costs. The last several years, not so much. So that caused the city to have to have a tougher look at its budget in 16 and now again next year. Uh, my priority would be a whole line of tax as well, doing two things. Undertaking a full review of services staffing to find those savings that are there for sure. And then prioritizing or reprioritizing all programs and services. Applying a fair chunk of the surplus the city is now carrying towards the deficit for next year. That's my main role, my main suggestion. That's my top priority. Uh, we have to leave some surplus for future, but we can lean heavily on taking more rather than less going into next year's budget. But as I said, it's important to support the expansion of the tax base. We must facilitate this in many ways, reasonable tax rates, of course, cutting down uh, red tape moving, making it easier to apply for permits, get through processes to get projects underway. And for new businesses, ease of processing, advice, and other forms of assistance, really important that the city be seen as helpful, not a hindrance. Economic development is a bottom line here, whether it's big business, small business, increasing housing, uh, with this is to help our population, and of course, to help the tax base grow. Thank you, Sandy. And the, the final answer on this question and the final answer of tonight's forum uh, goes to Maggie Burton. So Maggie, over to you on balancing taxation and spending to close us out whenever you're ready. Thank you, Josh. And thanks, Happy City, for having me and everyone else. Um, so I do believe that with some wisdom and some good fortune that we should be able to improve service levels without increasing your tax bill. So there's a hot take of the evening. Some of that, of course, is through the, uh, the magic word from this debate, which has been efficiencies, efficiencies, efficiencies. Our continuous improvement process is actually working. Um, our staff have been getting wage increases, haven't been getting wage increases, I'm sorry. Um, and of course, with continuous improvement, we've had uh, quarterly updates on our strategic plan, for example, that identifies how the asset management plan is coming along, which is a very complex and robust process that looks at every aspect of the city's assets. And I want to give a shout out to Deputy City Manager Derek Coffey, who's really passionate about asset management planning. So that's just one little thing. Um, when I talk about not increasing your tax bill, I mean that the average tax bill should not increase in dollars and cents. A lot of councillors talk about the mill rate, which is one variable that goes into your tax bill, and that's how St. John's taxes got so high. Between 2001 and 2016, people's tax bills just about doubled if you, me if you measure them in inflation-adjusted dollars, but the mill rate itself fell about 40%, so council acted as if taxes were falling and spread that message accordingly. Um, so I think tax is a dollar and cents issue and not a mill rate issue. Looking at that way, the budget crunch is not as dire as it seems and property assessments, even though they've fallen, we can change the mill rate to avoid service cuts while not increasing the actual amount that residents pay in taxes in that dollar and cents, and cents figure. After decades of promoting urban sprawl and increasing our costs to service the city, I think that we've turned the corner on that and I really hope that we start using our capital budget to improve our existing city footprint instead of having to spend more money on all the developments and, um, and sprawl that have been approved, especially between 2001 and 2016. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you to all of the candidates. Uh, this was 
an evening of very thoughtful responses. I, I want to say in particular, I really appreciate the fact that you all gave each other the space to articulate your own distinct visions and your distinct answers to these questions. I really enjoy uh, a respectful event like this. I think the folks viewing online now or, or the folks who will be watching the recording after uh, will value that as well. And so thanks again for, for taking the time. Uh, thanks to Happy City for hosting. I think that is it for me. Uh, I will pass maybe back over to Debbie Wiseman from Happy City's board in case there are any other housekeeping items before we clue up. Thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, I just want to say a few quick thank yous. Uh, thank you again to the candidates for coming and answering our questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who's watching at home and who's going to watch later. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Josh and to Julia, who hosted last night with very little notice. Um, <laughs> they took the job on. And uh, our ASL interpreters, who did a fantastic job on both nights, we really appreciate it. Um, my fellow Happy City volunteers. And I want to give a special shout out to um, our student who's working full time and also who is going to school full time and working with Happy City, Sarah. Sarah did an amazing job tonight. Sarah works her butt off. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she's going to be an asset to whoever she ends up with. Um, so we really appreciate you sharing your evening with us. And thank you and good night.